Uh, we've been doing a, a series in Psalm 145. It's just a wonderful psalm, isn't it? I hope that you all have been ministered to by God's word as David here composed this beautiful praise psalm for us. And we're in the third part of that here this morning. Remember, my thesis, what we've really been pointing to here is, is that it is always a good thing to think about God. Remember that quote I gave you from A.W. Tozer? It's the most important thing about us what comes into our minds when we think about God. It's almost like that's the start of the wave into the way that we see ourselves and our place in the world around us. It's all dictated in one direction or the other by the way that we see God, by how we understand Him. Rather than making idols for ourselves in our minds about who we wish God is, we look to God's Word and discover the best we can from His Word what He has revealed about Himself in His Word, the true and living God. I don't know about you, but sometimes that puts a frown on my face. I would have made it different in the way that He acts sometimes, but heaven help us if we depart from what the Scriptures say about who He is. But that really will dictate, it will be the cause of then how we see ourselves in the world around us and how we conduct our lives. Uh, either a high biblical view of who God is or something that, uh, like Tozer would say, is not worthy of Him. Something that, that, uh, that, in fact, insults him or blasphemes him. So it's our intent in Psalm 145 for these three weeks to look very carefully and directly at who God is and how he reveals himself in his word to us. Remember, by way of review, some of you who've been with us uh, for the last couple of weeks, that first week we looked at Psalm 145, verses 1 through 7, that really focused in on God's greatness that he is high and exalted. Remember the majesty of his splendor, his very brightness that is discussed or proclaimed by David. And it leads to this response where we meditate upon his greatness. We let that roll through our minds and let it sink down deeply into the roots of our very being, of his majesty, his glory. We meditate on that, but then we also declare it and we testify it. Remember the language that, that was used by David there, the verbs? Uh, shouting joyfully, singing loudly of the greatness of God. That was that first week, verses 1 through 7. Then last week, we saw things shift a little bit in verse 7 from the greatness of God to the goodness of God. And I put it this way, that why is God great? Well, one of the main reasons he's great is because he is good. And remember how much time we spent in verse 8 alone? I almost didn't get out of that verse the whole sermon where David declares like the rest of the scriptures in the Old Testament declare that God is gracious. He is merciful or compassionate. He is slow to anger and abounding in this. Remember the Hebrew word there that you have to spit a little bit? The chesed idea, abounding in loyal love or covenant love, faithful love. That is who he is, and he is good and good to all. So why is he great? One of the big reasons is because he is good. And again, we saw this repeated by David that we praise him for that. We think about it. We declare it. We shout joyfully of the goodness of God. That was verses 8 through 13 from last week. Now this week, we're going to look at the remainder of the psalm, Lord willing, verses 14 through 21, and this is going to get into specifically the nearness of God. That's what I titled this sermon, is Our God Who Is Near. The theological word for that is that He is imminent. He is actively involved. He is near. He is not distant from us. So if you follow that logic that I've been using for these three sections. God is great. Why? One of the main reasons He's great is because He's good. And now today, God is good. Why is He good? Well, one of the big reasons He is good is because He is near. That makes Him 
great and good because God is near. So I'm hoping this morning, I know that you all are busy. We've got a lot of things on our minds, Karen and I do. But I'm hoping just for a few minutes here together this morning that we can step out of the busyness of life here for a few minutes and just allow the text of this psalm to minister to us and lay aside all those things you got going on this afternoon and you anticipate for this week and all the things with the pastor coming in that. That's all going to take care of itself just fine about an hour from now. But Let's just look at God's word together to, and try to step back from that for a few minutes. So if you're over there in Psalm 145, I'd like to read it out loud. And if you want to follow along in your Bibles uh, silently, go ahead and do that. But I like reading the whole psalm. It's meant to be read to, as, a, as a whole. So let's look at the whole psalm together, and then we'll look at it a little bit closer. So here's Psalm 145. A psalm of praise of David. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wonderful works I will meditate. Men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts, and I will tell of your greatness. They shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness, and will shout joyfully of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all and his mercies are over all his works. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and your godly ones shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power, to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts and the glory of the majesty of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations." The Lord sustains all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. The Lord keeps all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. Amen. Join me in prayer, would you please? We do thank and praise you, God, for this psalm that David wrote 3,000 years ago, and yet it lives as we sing it again this morning. We thank you, God, for who you are and how you have made yourself known to us through your word. I pray this morning, God, that your Holy Spirit would be turned loose in this congregation and that he would perform his work powerfully within our hearts in those secret places and that it would come out of our mouths in testimony and declaration as we join in the song three millennia old to worship and praise you. Please answer this prayer. We're trusting that you are near and that you are listening and that you respond to our prayers, especially when we pray in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So did you hear it there in Psalm 145 that David here now, after bowing in praise at the wonder of God's majesty and his work, and after rejoicing in God's goodness manifest in his grace, his mercy, his patience, and his faithful love, now he's going to bring it home to our need in these last seven or eight verses together. I would offer to you that this last section of verses 14 through 21, it turns around the fulcrum or the pivot point of verses 17 and 18. Look at those again. You see it right in the middle of this section? 
where David says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. That this is the righteous, kind God who is near that is being declared in this section. And the whole thing is going to turn on that. Just a word about these terms again. We hear them a lot in church, and it's good just to step back and think about them for a minute. The idea of God being righteous again gets us back to last week. He is good. He is righteous without even having to try. Just by being himself, he does the good and right thing. That is because he defines goodness and righteousness. God is not subject to some eternal or external standard of goodness that he has to conform to. He wrote the book on righteousness. He is the one by by his very actions and nature that defines righteousness and goodness just by being himself. And then this word kind that is used here again in verse 17, kind in all his deeds. This is the word that is related to that chesed again. It's just said a little bit different. Kindness, chesed or chesed is related to his faithful, loyal love. So he is kind and his loyal or covenant love is extended to us. That means he's caring, he's gentle, he's loving. And then what we're going to look at in particular here in this section, notice that there in verse 18, he says, God is near to all who call upon him. And then in case you didn't hear it in the first line, to all who call upon him in truth. So I have to ask that question with you all this morning. What does that mean that God is near? What's the idea there behind God's nearness? Well, as I mentioned, the theological word for this is the idea of imminency, that God is in relationship with his creation. He is imminent. He is involved with it. He is close to it, if you want to call it that, and actively involved in his creation. If you wanted to say it in the negative, it, this means God is not distant. He is not detached from his creation. Sometimes we get this idea, if we're not careful, by distorting the idea of God's holiness. Because those of you who understand the idea of God's holiness, it's one of his major attributes declared in the Old Testament, right? Especially in the law. Well, his holiness carries with it the idea that God is in fact separate or unique or in a class of his own. There is nothing like him. No one or nothing like God. He is separate. So if you're not careful, that separation could be misconstrued as distant or detached. In fact, some of you know historically, this got into Christian circles about three centuries ago, and it, it, it's described as what we now call today as deism, where the deists thought that, yes, God created the universe, but then he stepped away from it, and he's not actively involved within it. So he started it, wound it up like a toy, and turned it loose, and he's not actively involved with it. That's not what David's saying here. God is near. But you see that danger? If you overemphasize the holiness of God, that sometimes we see God as being distant, detached. What would the transcendent, holy God want to have to do with little old me? In my little circumstance here in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. He runs the whole show. I'm just a little little speck over here. Well, take great comfort from this. He is near. He is imminent. He's not aloof or uninterested. Practically speaking, what does that mean for us? Well, I don't know about you, but I take great comfort and encouragement from the fact of an imminent, involved God who is near. In particular, what it means is that we have access to God as his followers, as his people. What does that mean? That means when we have the difficulties and the circumstances of life, he responds to us. He is not indifferent or removed from us. 
I think of this sometime when you have kids playing out in the yard together and doing all kinds of crazy stuff together while mom has the back window open in the kitchen there and she's doing her things there. The kid cries out, Mom! Mom! Any of you moms ever have that happen? Like every three minutes or so? Mom! I, I, I fell! Mom! I need this! Mom! Can we have a drink? Well, it's, the mom is able to shout out the window, I'm here. I, I, I'm listening. I hear you. That brings great comfort to that child, doesn't it? Because mom's right there. In case they think they need mom, she's there. Do you hear God's call in this psalm? I'm here. I'm, I'm listening. I'm right with you. You can have confidence in that. Anybody take any comfort from that and encouragement? Okay, again, I know we're not a Pentecostal church, so you just kind of... So. I'm glad I'm getting a few nods and grunts back there. I'll take it, okay? That's an awesome thing, isn't it? Think about it for a minute, those of you who know your Bibles. The Hebrews in the Old Testament, they had a very tangible way that they understood the imminence, the nearness, and the access to God all the way from Moses through the Old Testament with a couple of interruptions. You know what I'm talking about there? Where was the center of God's presence and His nearness and His access for those Hebrews in the Old Testament? Where was it? Well, the, the pillar of fire directly, that's right, Gretchen, but I heard people say it both ways, in the tabernacle originally and then in the temple that was built, right? You go all the way back to that last portion of Exodus when God gives the instructions for the building of the tabernacle and then they actually construct the thing. And then, as Gretchen pointed out, at the very end of Exodus chapter 40 there at the end of the book, it says that this pillar of fire came down over the tabernacle and the smoke during the day, the fire at night, and it was with them all the years that they were in the wilderness. This was the place where God was present for them. Now we could get into a theological distraction here and say, how is an omnipresent God not present everywhere and not just there? I'm not gonna get into that today. The short answer to that is God's presence in that tabernacle indicated that he was near so that he would respond to them when they came with their needs. If they had the need for forgiveness of sin, they would bring sacrifice and they would come and that would be the place where they would offer it and receive the forgiveness of sin. If they had questions or prayer requests, this was the place they went to to have confidence that God was near, He was present, He would listen and respond to their prayers. Remember how the King Solomon declares this explicitly in 1 Kings 8 when he dedicates the temple. What a glorious thing. Remember how many weeks that they celebrated? Christians and Hebrews, they know how to party, right? But in the midst of that prayer of dedication, Solomon, in essence, is declaring the truth about God that he is present now in that temple so that when they come with their requests, they can have confidence that he will respond. Whether it's an enemy that's threatening the nation, they will come and pray there and God will respond to them. They understood it. Solomon got that right. One of my favorite illustrations of this was a, a couple, three generations before Solomon. Remember with Samuel's parents, Elkanah and Hannah, that Hannah, Elkanah loved Hannah, but she didn't have any children, right? And it was a burden to her. So what did she do there in 1 Samuel? Well, she went with Elkanah where? To, well, the tabernacle in this case. Temple wasn't up yet, right? And she poured out her heart. Remember, she was so animated in her prayers that Eli the priest thought she'd been drinking. But she said, no, I have, a, I have a burden. And Eli sent her home and said, the Lord has heard you. And sure enough, she got pregnant. And here comes Samuel, the great prophet. Go there. That's the place they can have confidence. They have access to God, that he is near. He is responsive to their needs and to their cries. That is all the way through the Old Testament story. That place, the tabernacle the temple as that place where they come near. 
Well, now in New Testament terms, we have got it far better than they ever did in the Old Testament, don't they? Because of two things that we can read in the New Testament that just build upon this idea of the God who is near. The first of them comes manifest in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Remember what was predicted about this Messiah in Isaiah 7.14, very famous passage where it says that, Behold, I will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and bear a child. Remember what it says at the end of that? And his name will be called what? Emmanuel. And what does that mean? God with us that the Lord Jesus Christ came right among us. He came near. I love the way the Apostle John says this at the beginning of 1 John. Remember what he says? What we handled, what we touched, we had our hands on Him concerning the Word of life. He didn't just stand on some pulpit 50 feet away. He got right in there and rubbed shoulders. He was near. He is God with us. And He remains with us today. So that's the first great advantage that we have as Christians with the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. But then also, the second advantage we have is with the third person of the Trinity. Because we now know that the Holy Spirit has been given to us. I love the language that Jesus uses to describe Him in John 14 through 16, in those three chapters. Remember the word that Jesus uses for the Holy Spirit there? The Greek word is this word paraclete. You've all heard that one before, haven't you? And if you break it down, literally it means one who is called alongside. I love to translate that. Sometimes you see it translated comforter or encourager or exhorter, something like that. I love to translate it companion. The Holy Spirit is our companion. He's called right alongside. Again, He's not 50 feet away. He's not in some place that we have to go to to seek His access to Him. He is right here alongside. The Holy Spirit is our companion. He's the one right there with us. In fact, not just walking alongside, Paul goes even further in 1 Corinthians 6.19 when he encourages the Corinthians to knock it off with sexual immorality. Remember what he says? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you? I don't know about you, but that sounds like a God who is near, right? As followers of Christ, we now, our physical bodies, are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He actually lives inside of us. And notice it says He lives or He abides in us. He just doesn't come for a visit. He doesn't rent out a room for a couple of weeks. He lives. He has taken up residence within us. So if I understand this correctly, God's presence in the tabernacle in the Old Testament and in the temple, we now are the temple and the tabernacle of God. That means we don't have to go somewhere to gain access to God, to have confidence that He's going to hear our prayers. We have that confidence wherever we're at, regardless of the need. I'm not sure, I don't know you all that well, but I'm hoping that at Twin Cities Fellowship we don't have people that think that somehow if they've got some heavy-duty, really important prayer request, they got to go and they got to pray in this auditorium here. Because God is somehow really extra special present in this building. i got news for you. That does not line up real well with the way the New Testament describes God's presence. Or if it's a really heavy prayer request, maybe even have to go to one of these cathedrals with the stained glass windows and all that kind of stuff. Isn't God there more than you know, present in that? No, no, no. That's the glory of the resident Holy Spirit within our bodies that we have access to God. I love to pray that just to remind myself of this when I start my prayers to say, thank you, Lord, that we have access to you anytime, anywhere, no matter what. We don't have to go someplace and do something to have access to God. He is near. He is responsive right now, 
today, right at this moment. That's the access that we have to God. I almost feel like stopping right at this point and just challenging you to really seek to comprehend this and to grasp the reality of what that means. That God is with us. He is right alongside. He is within us as followers of Christ. That is a staggering claim that the Scriptures make. So let me ask you, is God near to you right now? Is He? God is near and I would also urge you and encourage you, God is near, but I'm not asking you for some kind of tingly feeling or something like that. That He is near, and we have the assurance of that, and the assurance of answered prayer, even when the feelings may not be there, and we are close to despair. I'm not sure in the context of Twin Cities Fellowship, but in my context as a college professor, I wrestle with this all the time with these students that are in their late teens and early 20s. My daughter put it really well. She said, you know, Dad, sometimes I think that for some of the students around here, God is a feeling. And if they don't feel God, he's not there. In fact, I just read it on Facebook yesterday. I love to scan through that. I hardly ever write anything on there, but I'm snooping around. I'm looking at what everybody else is writing on there. And this one young girl that I know, college student, she, put on, she posted. She said, oh, this has just been such a great week of being close to God because I've felt him all week long. I'm just going, oh, man, you know, there's so much more to that than what you're saying. I, I mean, I'm tr giving her the benefit of the doubt. I think I know what she means because some of you have had that experience where you have had the sense of God being very close in a special kind of a way. So I'm hoping it was that. But I wish you would have put, but, you know, he's there whether I feel it or not. He's promised us that he's near to us. He's alongside to us. I call that a quiet confidence in God and in his word. It's not something that maybe we'll fall over and, and uh, pass out or we'll have the tingly feeling, but it's there. God is here. He is near to us. The specifics of that, we'll look at it in verses 14 through 16. God's nearness here means that he's capable of satisfying every need. You see that? He's got the ability to do it. Verse 14, the Lord sustains all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Yeah, he's capable because he's near. He satisfies every need. And in fact, in verses 19 and 20, he tells us that he indeed does meet and satisfy the needs of those who seek him. Look at it again. Verse 19, he will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. The Lord keeps all who love him, but the wicked he will destroy. So if I'm understanding this right, and this is debated among some of the people who study the book of Psalms in Psalm 145, but if I'm understanding this correctly, what it means is God is capable. He's got the ability. It's part of the extent of his sovereign power and goodness to be able to satisfy every need of all of his creation. That's verses 14 through 16. And then God actually works to do that very thing for those who call upon him or for those who are his followers. So we never have to worry about the earth. He is capable of taking care of every need and every desire that anyone has. And he is assuring us here that he will do that for those who follow him. Verses 14 through 16, this is over all of the earth he's talking about. And did you notice here the specifics of that? Verse 14, he says, 
Yes, he's capable of addressing those who fall, who've been broken down through life's experiences. Have you had those experiences where you have experienced a defeat? Something has brought you down. You have fallen and raises up all who are bowed down. God is capable of meeting those crises, doesn't matter who, where, or when. He's sovereign. He's got the ability to do it. So he's able to come to the aid of those who are broken down by life circumstances. But then also, you see in verse 15, it says that he's also capable of meeting every daily mundane need of life. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. So it might not be a crisis, but it's still a need. God is capable of addressing every single one of them. There is no such thing as a need that is too trivial for God. Every mundane, everyday need of life, he's capable. We don't have to fear that, oh, my things just don't matter to God. Yeah, he's capable. He will meet those needs. I think this is something that's reflected in the New Testament in Matthew 6 in the Lord's Prayer. Some of you have committed that to memory. And I love it where in the Lord's Prayer it says something about our everyday need for bread in there. Give us our daily bread. That's not real provocative. That's not going to make headlines in the newspaper. But it is a real need. Those everyday needs. Monday needs. Theologically, we call this God's common grace. He's capable of distributing things to all of his creation, of meeting the needs and satisfying the desires of every living thing, both humans and the natural created order on the earth. We all depend upon God. We all are dependent upon his provision and he's capable of satisfying it. God's provision is capable of meeting all needs. We don't have to worry that somehow that God's capabilities are going to poop out on us. He's not going to have quite enough juice to be able to meet the needs that we have. Uh, They're not going to run out. He's got the ability to meet every need. And I love the language, the poetic language that that, uh, that David uses in verse 16, where he says, you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Isn't that a great figure? He opens his hand. It has both the, the connotation of caring for us and the provision is right there for us and it's almost effortless for God. He doesn't have to whip up something big. He's able to meet our needs effortlessly. And we're near to him. He makes those needs. He satisfies them. And one other thing about this, in verses 14 through 16, you hear how many times the word all is used in there? David's speaking in categorical terms, folks. He meets all those needs. You see it? The Lord sustains all who fall, verse 14. Raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you. His power is extended to all. Everyone is included in this. So God is capable of meeting all of these needs. Now verses 18 through 20, he meets the needs of those, all those who call on him. Verse 18, you see it there? Those who call on him in truth. Verse 19, he meets the needs of those who fear him. And verse 20, he meets those needs of those who love him. So those who call upon him, those who fear him, those who love him. God fulfills their desire, he says in verse 19. He hears their cry, again in verse 19. He saves them, obviously, when they're in a predicament and an obstacle is in their way. He delivers them or saves them from it. And in verse 20, he repeats it by saying, he keeps them or preserves them through those difficulties. And again, the word all is used repeatedly there four times in those three verses. This is categorical for all of those who call upon him. 
who fear Him, who love Him. I'm not sure what this does for you. It gives me ammunition for my prayer and my faith to know this is the true and the living God. He is the one who meets those needs. He is capable for all of the earth. And you call upon Him, you fear Him, you love Him. He's saying He will meet those needs. He will come through in those circumstances. Well, the the big question, though, that comes, I'm sorry, I was just ready to say, is there any questions about that? I'm an old teacher here, you know, and you like to get people going. But this is a sermon. I'm not supposed to do that, okay? One of the big questions that comes out of this, though, is, in fact, to ask the question, but what if he doesn't seem to be near? What if the wheels have fallen off of the vehicle of my life and I am in desperation, one trial and difficulty and circumstance of suffering after the other? If this congregation is typical at all, we could fill pages with lists of difficulties and trials and challenges and suffering that you've gone through. And what, where, where is God in all that? He seems distant, doesn't he? Well, can I address that a little bit with you all here? Would that be okay here this morning? Sure, okay, good. Number one, I want to assure you that this isn't something that God hasn't thought about and addressed in his word. In fact, I would offer to you, there is a whole series of psalms in the book of psalms that are addressed to this very thing. Sometimes they're described as lament psalms. You hear the word lament there, or mourning, or grieving. David himself wrote several of these lament psalms. If you want a couple to get started on, they're little shorty, itty-bitty ones, look at Psalm 3 or Psalm 6. They are psalms where David is crying out, and in some of them, he cries out, Where are you, O Lord? So sometimes the feeling is not there, that there is a sense of abandonment. So we have to counterbalance what we're reading here in Psalm 145 about the Lord being near with that experience of God's presence where sometimes He seems to be distant, right? So what do we do about that during those really important, difficult times of suffering? This is when this is really big when we start thinking about God's nearness in terrible circumstances. What do I do if God doesn't seem near? Well, you know, I don't want to be overly simplistic, folks, but this is where we have to come back to what we believe and what we know of God's Word. And I don't know about you, but this is the challenge that I face myself to say, am I going to believe God's Word or not? I need to make a decision here. Am I going to allow my circumstances to dictate what I believe, or am I going to take God's Word for what it says, and believe it. So in this case, the challenge for me is to say, God is near. He may not feel like it, but He is near, and therefore the challenge for me is to cling to Him by faith, to remain confident, and look to Him to see me through the difficulty, or the suffering, or the challenge that I'm feeling and I'm experiencing at this time. I have to depend upon Him completely. I don't know about you all, sometimes I have, actually have a conversation with myself about this. It helps sometimes to get in the bathroom and look in the mirror if, if that helps for some of you and say, okay, Mark, what are you going to believe here? I know what you're feeling, but what are you going to believe? You're going to believe God's Word or are you going to let all of this carry you off into despair because you don't feel it? at this time. God is near. Depend on Him completely. You don't feel it? Continue to trust Him. Part of that 
is remembering God's plans for us. I don't have a great deal of time to get into this in any detail with you all this morning. But as you read God's word, you see more and more of this plan that God has for us sinking into our perspective. Just a couple of verses that come to mind of, of Romans 8, 28, where God works all things together for good for those who love him, who are the called according to his purpose. To cling to those type of promises in this, to remember his plans for us. Because really, we have to step back here for a minute, and I'm sorry if this is an insult or some of you, this is going to sting you a little bit, but it stings me just as bad, so we're all in this together, all right? That God's plan for us, he is committed to our growth and our maturity. He is not committed to our ease or to our comfort. And that really stings, doesn't it? Real easy for me to say this right now standing up here. But in the midst of that trial and suffering and pain, this to me, it helps. It's, a, it's just like a good wake-up call. That God, He is not committed to my ease or to my comfort. He's committed to my good and to my growth and my maturing in Christ. In my humble opinion, folks, I think this has been a terrible perversion of Christianity that's taken place, of biblical Christianity, especially in the United States and the prosperity that we've experienced in this country. For many of us Christians, we have these false expectations about what God's blessing looks like. We need to listen to some of our brothers and sisters around the world that can run laps around us as far as their joy and contentment and intimacy with God in the midst of prison sentences and half starving to death and seeing family members taken away from them. All sorts of pain and suffering. But it draws them closer to God. It grows them as Christians. How do we define happiness? Is it personal peace and prosperity? I'm not so sure about that. I think those are false expectations. I think I'm preaching to the choir here to say that, that oftentimes God will use those trials and those difficulties to get through to me. That I won't listen unless I'm two or three steps from despair. Isn't that what James is saying in James chapter 1 when he talks about rejoicing in trials? American Christians read that, at least this American Christian reads it and says, you're nuts. We've got to take you to the psychologist, James. You don't rejoice in trials, but he substantiates it, doesn't he, to say from what comes from it and how God is able to reach us and cultivate us as his children. Sometimes I find I'm hard to reach any other way than through difficulty or trial. In particular, there's a couple of things, and I don't, again, have time to develop this, but I would warn you against these and to be careful. One of them's pretty obvious. The other one may not be for you. A couple of things that I'm exposed to that helps to build false expectations that I have about comfort and ease in life. One of them is this whole tradition and fad that started in the United States and it's going worldwide. It goes by the label of prosperity theology or the health and wealth kind of teaching out there. All you got to do is turn on the TV and cable and you're going to see plenty of preachers that are proclaiming this thing. You're God's child. He's not going to give you junk. He's going to give you the very best and you're going to prosper in that. That's a pretty easy target to resist that prosperity gospel, that prosperity theology. The other one, not so easy, but I'm more and more leery of it the more I'm exposed to it. And that's Christian fiction. You gotta be careful because oftentimes in the course of one little movie or one little book that we read, it just, you know, these people go through these things, but everything just works out great and we, we end it with a nice happy smile on our faces and we just get that expectation. This is just the way life works, especially with a television program. Aren't you all cynical about that? How these earth-shaking world crises are solved in 52 minutes on a TV show? It's fiction. 
That's not the way that life often works. And there's not going to be some easy answer that comes out because some scriptwriter or some author made it that way. So I'm not saying reject Christian fiction by no means here. But at least look at it with some discernment here and say, am I being led down a path here that is unrealistic as far as my expectations of God? I would offer to you folks that for us to cling to God to draw upon Him in faith in the middle of that suffering and those trials and those difficulties, it fuels our testimony among one another and to a watching world. Especially to a watching world. To realize that, hey, you know, these Christians, they face the same bad circumstances that I do. They have the same kinds of challenges and difficulties in life. And look at the way that they are able to go through this. Why? Because we trust God will see us through in the midst of the agony and the difficulty as we trust God. It is a testimony of encouragement to the brotherhood and sisterhood, and it brings reality to a watching world. Not some hypocritical, fake Christianity, but the real thing to cling to God in the midst of those trials. God will see us through. So I'm asking you this morning here, are you experiencing pain? Are you bowed down and falling? The declaration of this psalm is, seek the Lord, call upon Him, fear Him, Love Him. He is near. Or in the words of verse 21, My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless His name forever and ever. I will speak of His praises. We thank You, God, for Your Word. And I pray, Lord, this morning it would imprint us that our character and our nature would be marked forever by your word as we read it in Psalm 145 and in the rest of your word. And it would change us, God, not just the way we think, but it would transform the way we live. That even in the midst of difficulty and suffering and pain, God, I pray that you would give these people, and me too, the strength of faith and confidence in you to hold on to you no matter what, no matter how difficult or despairing circumstances may look because you are the God who sustains all who call upon you. You do open your hand and satisfy every single one of us. Please God help us not to just know this but to live it out. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.